Before I left SHAPE headquarters in 1967, the SHAPE military people knew that there were four different groups that we were dealing with. There were four separate extraterrestrial intelligences involved. When I retired in 1976, the military knew, at least the U.S. military, and I am assuming the British as well, knew of at least 12 different groups that were coming and going and involved with us. I've been told by friends who are still working in high places, people who seem to know, people whose information I trust, that there may be well over a hundred different groups coming and going from God knows where. The one that interested the generals the most in 1964 and 1967, the one that drove them up the wall, was the one group, one out of the four, looked exactly like we do. And I don't mean similar, I mean exactly. So much so that they could sit next to you in an airplane or in a restaurant or in a theater, and you would never know. You would literally never know. And that bothered the admirals and the generals a lot. Because we military have always been, we are trained to be paranoid. It's the nature of our game. The idea that there could be alien intelligence looking so much like us that they could walk up and down the corridors of shape headquarters. They could walk up and down the corridors of the Pentagon. One day at lunch, a lieutenant colonel, a U.S. lieutenant colonel, says, my God, man, do you realize they could even be in the White House? Well, there was a little forced laughter at that point because a lot of us, particularly we Americans, have had some misgivings over the years about who was ending up in the White House. I will share briefly with you that I have some misgivings about the present occupant. But I won't go into any specifics on that issue. It bothered him a lot that one of these groups looks so much like us, and I'd like to twist that around if I may. It's not that they look like us. We look like them. And there's a very good reason for it. And I'll touch upon that. We also learned, when I left the service in 1976 and lost my clearance, could no longer visit and bug the hell out of my good friends, we knew that we were not simply dealing with extraterrestrial visitation from other planets. That was a given. We were not dealing just with interplanetary visitation. We were dealing with interstellar visitation. We were dealing with intergalactic visitation. And the one and the final thing that drove our scientists and our military planners, even some of our philosophers, wild was that apparently we were dealing with advanced intelligences that appeared to be multidimensional in their source and some of these advanced races apparently had the ability to manipulate matter and time they had repeated these kind of things all the time they had demonstrated them repeatedly specifically to get our attention I stopped for a moment and stopped to think what that means. We're not just having little guys coming here from other planets or other stars or other galaxies. We're having advanced intelligences here interrelating with us, interested somehow in us, interested enough to come and be involved with us, that apparently are multidimensional and some of those more advanced ones can manipulate time and matter. My God, that turns our old Newtonian Einstein physics absolutely upside down. The only people who I know today who can even begin to deal with this kind of reality are theoretical physicists. There are quantum physicists in Great Britain. There are quantum physicists in the United States. Many of them are working together at large U.S. universities who apparently are on the edge of grasping what multidimensional visitation is all about. I'm not a physicist, I'm not a scientist like Stan. I can't begin to tell you what a dimension is for that matter. I'm told we live in three, and that's quite a simple world that we have around us. I'm told that time and space is the fourth. Theoretical physicists have told me that there are as many as ten different dimensions. 
I cannot for a moment grasp what that means. I do, however, accept that it's probably real. The evidence that I have seen over my last 40 years have told me that this is not fantasy, this is not science fiction, this is all real. And ladies and gentlemen, this reality, when it becomes known, and when it makes an impact upon our world, is going to change our world forever. You talk about a paradigm shift, that's an understatement. The old world we have known for so long is literally coming to an end. And it's just around the corner. And very Let me tell you how keen this guy is. I picked Bob, Cecilia and Stanton up from Manchester Airport in the early hours of last Thursday morning, week last Thursday morning. At 10.20 that same evening, he was stood with me on the top of the roof of the Hilton Hotel giving an interview for GMTV which was broadcast the following day because he thought it was important that people get to know about the subject. The man's enthusiasm is quite incredible. He's currently completing the manuscript for his book entitled The Time Has Come. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to meet Robert Dean. Thank you for that warm welcome. I think it's appropriate before I begin that I say a few words of appreciation, particularly to Quest International, the publishers of UFO magazine, special warm thanks to Graham, Tony, and Mark and their lovely families. But I also want to say a special thanks to those of you who are here this evening. I commend you for your curiosity and your interest on this difficult, incredible subject. And I'm delighted to see so many open-minded, curious people here this afternoon. It, it's gratifying for me because it tells me that there is hope. I've been involved in this, this field for a number of years. There are times when I, uh, I get kind of discouraged. There are times when I feel like I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, as it were. I've been yelling and complaining and raising hell for a long time about this subject. And for a while I didn't think no one was paying attention or listening, but seeing a group like you here this evening and seeing you hang around and stay when we're running at least a well over an hour over time, thank you very much for that. I commend you. Now, how do I begin here? I'm here because I do believe that this subject is not only the most important subject of our time, I'm convinced it's probably the most important issue in the history of the human race. And before I complete my presentation this afternoon, I hope to have provided you enough information to support that opinion of mine and I hope maybe that you might agree with me. I really don't talk about UFOs much anymore because there are no such things. Your government and mine has known for at least 40 years what these objects are. Your government and mine, and I must say this and bluntly, the Ministry of Defense, Department of Defense have literally been in bed together since 1947. It's nice to know that we're allies, but I want you to understand that the cover-up and the lie has come from your government as well as mine. They're both guilty. That's another reason why I'm speaking out, and I'm very angry about this, because as I say to the American people, the American taxpayers who pay the bills, you not only have a right to know the truth on this matter, you have a need to know. And I'm damn sick and tired of bureaucrats lying to the people, whether it's in London, Leeds, or the United States. The lying has got to stop. It's time to tell the truth on what I consider to be the most important issue in our history. Now, before I begin, it's also important that I give you a couple of quotes that I believe are important. 
quotes that I think that are very appropriate to this subject. <clears throat> and I ask you to think about these quotes as I continue with my presentation. One is from the first act of Hamlet where the young prince says to a, his good friend, he says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in your philosophy. And that's certainly true. I like to quote the British scientist Haldane, I believe he was an astronomer, who a number of years ago said that the universe is not only stranger than we know, it is stranger than we can know. And I'd like for you to consider that as I make my presentation this afternoon. Now I think it's important to give you just a little bit of background. I think Graham read a little bit of material on it. I spent most of my adult life as a professional soldier. Most of those years were in the infantry, special operations, special forces. I've had special assignments. I've been places I should not have been, and I've done things over the years that I should not have done. But that's history now. I did the best I knew how. I served my country as loyally as I knew how. But I have got to tell you that what I'm doing now is a violation of my national security oath. The material that I'm sharing, the material that I talk about, is in direct violation of my sworn oath. And I want you to know this, particularly some of the older men in this audience who are retired military. I am not doing this lightly. I'm not doing this frivolously. I'm doing it purposely and intentionally on this particular subject and on this subject alone. I will go to my grave carrying secrets. There, will think, there are things I will never divulge that I've sworn an oath never to talk about. But on this subject, I'm going to violate my oath continually and regularly, and I'm going to rock their cage, rock their boat, raise hell, until at some point in time, your government and mine decides to tell we, the people, the truth on this issue. Well, what is this issue? <clears throat> and how did I get involved? As I said, I've been most of my life in the military. Altogether, I've spent 41 years of service for the United States government, 27 in the Army and 14 with FEMA. <clears throat> but in 1963, I was favored with one of those special plum assignments that you often hear about in the military. I was assigned to the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers in Europe in 1963. It was an opportunity to take, to take my family to Paris. My kids went to high school in Paris. I spent almost five years in Paris working at Shape Headquarters just outside of Paris at a little town known as Rocancourt. I stayed there until the summer, late summer of 1967. And at that point, I helped move the headquarters from Paris up to its present location just outside of Brussels. <clears throat> General de Gaulle decided in 1967 to withdraw from the military alliance. And as a result, we were forced to pick up the entire headquarters and move it up to Brussels. France was, remained a member of NATO, but they withdrew from the military alliance. And they are still separate from the shape military alliance. I arrived in the summer of 1963. I had a top secret clearance at that time. I was immediately given an upgrade of a cosmic top secret clearance, which was and still is the highest level of clearance that NATO has. I had to have a cosmic clearance to work in the war room, a place we called Shock, the Supreme Headquarters Operations Center. When I arrived in 63, I learned of a study that had been initiated in 1961. This study had been the result of some very, very awkward and difficult events that had been happening in Europe. Will you put the first slide up, gentlemen? <clears throat> this is the seal of the Shape Headquarters where I spent five years of my life. The study was initiated in 61, and it was initiated by a British air marshal by the name of Sir Thomas Pike, one of your famous, highly decorated World War II heroes. Sir Thomas at that time was the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. 
He worked very closely with my boss, General Lyman Lemnitzer, an American four-star army general who at that time was the supreme Allied commander in Europe. What had been happening in the late 50s and the early 60s was that large numbers of circular metallic objects had been flying all over Europe, generally coming out of the Soviet sector. How about the next slide, gentlemen? Thank you, if you will. <clears throat> oh, I guess I can move that here myself if I think about it. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a Cold War map. It still shows a divided Europe. What had been happening in the 50s and 60s is that these large numbers of objects had been flying out of the Soviet sector. From deep in the Soviet Union, they would fly over the Warsaw Pact area, they would fly over a divided Germany, over France, they would generally fly over the southern coast of England on the Channel, and then these objects would disappear off of, off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea. They were large, they were fast, they flew at a very high altitude, they flew in formation, and they were obviously under intelligent control. And the Soviets for a long time thought they belonged to us. And for a time, we honestly thought they might have belonged to the Soviets. But we learned, both of us, after a few years, that neither one of us had the capability in 1961. None of us even today have the capability, the technological capability that those objects were demonstrating in the 50s and the 60s. But here we are. It's a Cold War. Hundreds of thousands of troops are facing each other across a divided Europe. Our fingers are on the triggers and our thumbs are on, poised above that red button. Nuclear war was moments away. And the last thing we needed was go to war with the Soviets for the wrong reason at the wrong time. And these unusual objects were stirring things up regularly. Well, after a particularly exciting, I say, it's probably the best word I can come up with without violating my code of ethics here. I'm an old infantryman. I tend to use certain words from time to time that uh, would offend the ladies. After a particular event on the 2nd of February, 1961, 2 o'clock in the morning, all hell broke loose, literally. The war room erupted. We went on red alert. The Soviets were on red alert. They closed Berlin. They sent up aircraft. We sent up aircraft. It was all over in about 16, 18 minutes. But for about 18 minutes, it was just hell. We were really close to the war. Air Marshal Pike decided at that time that he'd had enough of this. He wanted to know who these things were, what they were, where they were from, why they were here, and what was happening. Well, they initiated a study in 1961. They called it an assessment. The document itself was roughly an inch and a half thick and it was supported by about eight inches of appendices and annexes. There were 10 appendices and annexes. This thing was published in 1964. Copy number one was given to the Secretary General of NATO who had funded this research. Copy number two went to General Lyman Lemnitzer, my boss, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, Copy number three was placed in the vault in the war room where I worked. In those years, we worked on 12-hour shifts. When this thing was placed in the war room and I had an opportunity to see it, and I had an opportunity to pull it out of the vault every time I was on duty, I read it, I reread it, I practically memorized it, and it's not beyond doubt that I was never, ever, the same from that moment on. This three-year study that had been devised, designed as a strictly military study, changed my life. I could not put it down. I could not walk away from it. I've never been the same since. Literally, I must tell you in all honesty, I'm probably obsessed by this subject. But let me tell you some of the things I've learned, and I think you may understand why. I'm going to be telling you things that I've seen, things that I have learned, 
and then I'm going to be sharing with you some things that I have concluded after 30 years of research. So you can understand, hopefully, where I'm coming from in this thing. By the way, this is what the objects looked like. An actual photograph. A disc-shaped object. They varied anywhere from 35 feet to 90 feet in size. They were generally disc-shaped. They had a dome on top. This is another photograph taken over a village along the Rhine River in Germany. You can see, I believe, there's a castle on the hill up here. The Rhine River is back here. The photographer who took this particular object said that none of this below was visible to his eye. When he saw was a circular disc object with a dome on top and he snapped the camera and the camera saw this, but he didn't. We've surmised over the years that it's probably a manifestation of a propulsion system of some kind, an energy system. Camera saw it, but the eyeball did not. You can turn off that particular projector, fellows, right at the moment, if you will. This study was designed as a military study to determine was there or was there not a military threat involved. They titled it an assessment. It had a subtitle of an evaluation of a possible military threat to Allied forces in Europe. After three years, some of the conclusions were absolutely mind-boggling. They still are. I must tell you at this moment that in 1964, when this study was concluded and published, I was to learn later that your government and mine knew most of this material and most of these conclusions as early as 1949. But they decided they could not share that with you. They didn't trust you. They didn't consider you were mature enough, emotionally mature enough, to deal with this subject. You couldn't handle this reality because you were running hysterically through the streets. I resent that. I disagree with that. Then I disagree with it now. And as I said, I demand that they tell us the truth. These eight inches of annexes and appendices, however, contained the meat of this study. They were the aspects of the research that contributed to the conclusions. I just want to read a few of these annexes. There was one on radar and electromagnetic effects. There was one on optical and light analysis. There was an annex on photographic and holographic analysis. There was one on historical research and evidence. There was one on metallurgical and technical analysis. There was one on atmospheric physics and meteorological studies. Biological analysis and autopsies, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later. Sociological studies and implications. Psychological studies and effect of the mass effect of this subject. And the last and not the least, and the one I think probably is one of the most important over the years, is the theological implications and the worldwide impact of what this subject might mean. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why the, the lid has been placed firmly down, why they classified it cosmic at that time, why this report is still in NATO files, still declared cosmic top secret and is still considered to be probably the, s the most sensitive document NATO has. Now what was this study all about? When they finished it up and I had a chance to read it, it not only had an impact upon me, it had an impact upon every one of us in the war room. There were colonels and generals and admirals and there were air marshals and commodores, squadron leaders. Everybody who saw it was affected by it. No one of us have ever been the same. Let me tell you basically what the, the study concluded in 1964. <clears throat> the planet Earth and apparently the entire human race is and has been the subject of an extensive, intensive, and massive survey and examination by several Remember that. Several extraterrestrial civilizations. This study has been extremely thorough and detailed. These civilizations have demonstrated not only high intelligence, 
but an extremely advanced technology that may possibly be hundreds, if not thousands, of years beyond our own. Evidence collected and studied by this report indicates that apparently there is some kind of a process or a plan unfolding. They, whoever they are, continually demonstrate that the development of some kind of a program is underway. They could see that in 64 as a result of the three-year study. Over the years, we've seen it continue. We know it even pro pro progresses to that today. There is something happening. Something is unfolding. There's some development taking place. That's why I consider it so crucial that people pay attention and inform themselves about what's really been going on. The evidence in this report leads to the conclusion that this survey or program has been going on for a very long time, possibly several thousands of years. Military intelligence analysis have concluded that there did not, repeat, did not appear to be a major military threat involved. The conclusions seem to indicate that if they were either malevolent or hostile, there was absolutely nothing that what we could do at, the, at that time. And I have got to tell you in all honesty, there's absolutely nothing we can do at this time. The technology that was repeatedly demonstrated over the years and is still continually demonstrated is so far beyond anything we, and I say we, the US, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, most of the major nations on this planet have not even, are not even close to developing the kind of technology that these extraterrestrial intelligence have. NATO and SHAPE policy dictates that an ongoing study continue, be continued by the various military committees and that as many resources as possible by the major powers be committed to this matter. The entire subject is considered to be of the highest importance and extremely sensitive. This committee recommends that the highest level of classification be placed upon this matter, and if approved by SACUR, to be cosmic top secret or above. The subject is still in the file. Cecilia and I visited Brussels, went, went to SHAPE headquarters two years ago. Because of my history and because of my clearances, I still have a few friends in sensitive places went to shape, visited the headquarters, spent an entire afternoon there, digging, nosing around, trying to find out what I could. All I could find out it was the damn thing was still in the file, was still classified cosmic, and is still the most sensitive thing that NATO has. But I have just read to you the conclusions of this military study that was published in 1964. And I think you can understand the impact that that study had upon me and everybody who saw it and read it. There were several American top-ranking generals at that time who were deeply affected by this thing. There was one in particular, an American four-star Air Force general by the name of Robert Lee. Now, Bob Lee had been a good friend of Curtis LeMay, who was the commander of the Strategic Air Command. They'd gone to school together. They'd come up and rank together. They were both four-star generals. General Lee, in 1964, was General Lemnitzer's air deputy. He was responsible for all air operations throughout Europe. <clears throat> when he read the report, his aide told me, he says, the old man went into a state of shock. He was sitting at his desk, and he threw his hat across the room, and he says, do you realize what this means? Jesus, do you realize what this means? Everything we've ever done, everything we have, all of our missiles, all of our satellites, all of our nuclear weapons, it doesn't mean a thing. He was in such shock about it that he, I think he retired early. He retired within a year of being exposed to this study. This study had that kind of impact on almost everybody who read it and became a part of it. It had an impact on me. It launched me on a 30-year synthesis of trying to figure out not only what was happening. This was a beginning for me. 
The study and its conclusions were a beginning for me. I wanted to know more. I couldn't be satisfied not knowing more. And for the rest of my career, until I retired in 1976, I was a complete nut. Some of my friends would see me coming, and they'd say, oh, Jesus, close the door. Here comes Dean. Keep his nose out of our files. I would go and visit, and I had the clearance, and I would call in old debts and old favors, and I would stick my nose in their files. Until I left the service in 76, I was a real bug on this matter. I learned more and more, and the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. I wanted to know what the military knew. I wanted to know what the politicians and the scientists knew. What they knew in 64 was only the tip of the iceberg. I wanted to know what it was all about. My initial research as the military was who are they, where are they from, and why are they here? And that was my impetus and my drive for very many years. I learned very quickly that there was no simple, easy way to learn anything about this, that there was no discipline that I could ever follow that would give me a clear and understandable picture of what was happening. I found out most of our great scientists were specialists in their fields, historians, psychologists, um, atmospheric physicists, whatever, atomic physicists, nuclear physicists. Every one of our great scientists have this narrow specialty field that they spend their lives working on. And they know very often very, much, very little about what's out on the sides. They know their, their discipline, they study it, they devote their life to it. But they don't necessarily have the time and the discipline to broaden their perspective and broaden their view. Well, as a trained intelligence analyst, a man who has no numbers or letters behind his name at all, a man who at that time had not even finished his university training, I was a rabid nut about trying to find the answers to this. And as I said, I'd been trained to be an intelligence analyst. So I began to ply my skill as an intelligence analyst to this research. I found that I had to dig into history. I had to dig into philosophy, literature, mythology, anthropology, geology, theology, many of the hard sciences, and I had to even get into art and music before I began to get what I considered to be an overall perspective of what I thought was happening. Now, I must tell you, what I'm sharing with you this evening is my opinion. It's a result of 30 years of my synthesis, my personal search, my personal odyssey. I don't want a, one of you to leave this room this evening believing anything I may have said because I said it. But I would like to have you leave this room this evening with an enhanced, piqued curiosity so that you'll go out there and do your own research inform yourselves as I did and tell yourself from researching this what really is going on and reach your own conclusions. Don't accept mine. I challenge you to do your own research but I challenge you also once you've really dug into this thing you'll never be able to walk away from it. You'll never be able to put it down and you will never ever be the same. So I would say to you in advance, welcome to the club. Now, there are other things that happened over the years. <clears throat> when I began my research, I was curious about the hardware. Who they were, where they were from, why they were here, what it was all about. And I learned over the years that my focus changed. The direction of my intention began to change. After about 15 to 20 years, it became apparent to me that it was not necessarily who are they and why are they here and where are they from. It was really the most important thing to me. I began to realize that there was a, an aspect of this research. There was a component beyond the hardware and the reality of extraterrestrial visitation. I became aware that there's what I call a spiritual component to this matter, 
which I have concluded is roughly 90% of this entire thing, beyond the hardware, beyond who they are and where they're from and why they're here, what's really important to me in my studies today, and I challenge you again, because I think once you get involved with this yourselves, you'll probably come up with the same conclusions I did. What's really important is who are we, where did we come from, how did we come to be here? What is our life and the meaning of our life all about? And where are we going as a species? And that has become the central focus of my research over the years. I don't investigate UFOs anymore. The evidence for their reality, as Stanton has told you, is overwhelming. We have an abundance of data. We have an overabundance of data. We don't need any more data to prove the reality of UFOs or extraterrestrial spacecraft. What we do need to know is what's it all about? What is really happening? What is the meaning of their being here at this particular time? What is happening in the world today that they're interested in and involved in? What should we begin to pay attention to? Well, I'll share a little bit of what I think is really happening here. <clears throat> now, before I left SHAPE headquarters in 1967, the SHAPE military people knew that there were four different groups that we were dealing with. There were four separate extraterrestrial intelligences involved. When I retired in 1976, the military knew at least the US military, and I am assuming the British as well, knew of at least 12 different groups that were coming and going and involved with us. I've been told by friends who are still working in high places, people who seem to know, people whose information I trust, that there may be well over 100 different groups coming and going from God knows where. The one that interested the generals the most in 1964 and 1967, the one that drove them up the wall, was the one group, one out of the four, looked exactly like we do. And I don't mean similar, I mean exactly. So much so that they could sit next to you in an airplane or in a restaurant or in a theater, and you would never know. You would literally never know. And that bothered the admirals and the generals a lot. Because we military have always been, we are trained to be paranoid. It's the nature of our game. The idea that there could be alien intelligence looking so much like us that they could walk up and down the corridors of shape headquarters. They could walk up and down the corridors of the Pentagon. One day at lunch, a lieutenant colonel, a U.S. lieutenant colonel, says, my God, man, do you realize they could even be in the White House? Well, there was a little forced laughter at that point because a lot of us, particularly we Americans, have had some misgivings over the years about who was ending up in the White House. I will share briefly with you that I have some misgivings about the present occupant. But I won't go into any specifics on that issue. It bothered him a lot that one of these groups looks so much like us, and I'd like to twist that around if I may. It's not that they look like us, we look like them. And there's a very good reason for it, and I'll touch upon that. We also learned, when I left the service in 1976 and lost my clearance, could no longer visit and bug the hell out of my good friends, we knew that we were not simply dealing with extraterrestrial visitation from other planets. That was a given. We were not dealing just with interplanetary visitation. We were dealing with interstellar visitation. We were dealing with intergalactic visitation. And the one and the final thing that drove our scientists and our military planners, even some of our philosophers, wild, was that apparently we were dealing with advanced intelligences that appeared to be multidimensional in their source. 
And some of these advanced races apparently had the ability to manipulate matter and time. They had repeated these kind of things all the time. They had demonstrated them repeatedly, specifically to get our attention. Now stop for a moment and stop to think what that means. We're not just having little guys coming here from other planets or other stars or other galaxies. We're having advanced intelligences here interrelating with us, interested somehow in us, interested enough to come and be involved with us, that apparently are multidimensional and some of those more advanced ones can manipulate time and matter. My God, that turns our old Newtonian Einstein physics absolutely upside down. The only people who I know today who can even begin to deal with this kind of reality are theoretical physicists. There are quantum physicists in Great Britain, there are quantum physicists in the United States, many of them are working together at large U.S. universities, who apparently are on the edge of grasping what multidimensional visitation is all about. I'm not a physicist, I'm not a scientist like Stan. I can't begin to tell you what a dimension is for that matter. I'm told we live in three, and that's quite a simple world that we have around us. I'm told that time and space is the fourth. Theoretical physicists have told me that there are as many as ten different dimensions. I cannot for a moment grasp what that means. I do, however, accept that it's probably real. The evidence that I have seen over my last 40 years have told me that this is not fantasy, this is not science fiction, this is all real. And ladies and gentlemen, this reality, when it becomes known and when it makes an impact upon our world, is going to change our world forever. You talk about a paradigm shift, that's an understatement. The old world we have known for so long is literally coming to an end. And it's just around the corner. And very few people are prepared for it. <clears throat> but I ramble a bit. Let me go on and see where I am here. There's so much. I jokingly told Graham I had five hours of material and only an hour and a half to present it. And I've got some slides I'd like to share with you if you don't get bored and want to get up and leave. What have I concluded? I told you things I've seen, I've told you things I've been a part of, I've told you about military studies and reports that I've been a part of, that I've had a chance to read. I've told you that your government and mine has been lying to us for well over 40 years. I told you bluntly that basically they're scared to death about how to tell you some of the things they've learned because they don't know how you're going to deal with it. I disagree with them. I don't think any of you are going to run hysterically through the streets. I've spoken to people like you around the world, and it's my opinion, particularly the British people, are sound, emotionally stable people, and I haven't seen one of you run hysterically out of the auditorium. And I've been speaking here now for well over a week. <clears throat> I'll tell you what I've concluded. And I'll try to get on with this quickly so I can get into this slideshow. <clears throat> we are not alone, and we have never been alone. We have had, as I have said and repeatedly say, we have had an intimate interrelationship with advanced intelligence from somewhere out there. And it's not just time and space as we know it. I say somewhere out there, I'm talking about different dimensions as well. The human race has had a continual, intimate interrelationship with advanced extraterrestrial intelligence from the beginning of our history. Now there's more, and it's a little sensitive. It's somewhat sensitive in a theological way. I have concluded that the human race, us, we, are a hybrid race, that we have been genetically placed here, we have been seeded on this planet, and we have been continually genetically manipulated, and I say continually, from the beginning of our history into what we are today. 
the process is still going on. It's still underway. It has not stopped. And the abduction scenario and all of the things that many of you are beginning to pay attention to and are learning about is real and it's happening. This intimate interrelationship is intimate. They're involved in our genetics. They're involved in our racial development. They're involved in our evolution. They have been involved in that since the beginning of our history. Some of them over the centuries, thousands of years, hundreds and thousands of years back, when we had a relationship and a contact with them, we had a tendency to deify them. Thus, we have all of these great world religions. That's an also a sensitive subject to get into, because I flatly state, in my opinion, after many, many years of research, that every major world religion on this planet has had its origin from extraterrestrial sources. And every great theological philosophy and every great book from the Bible to the Bhagavad Gita to the Quran to the writings of the Buddha, every one of those tells essentially the same story. I have gone on the line and I have put my neck out on the block, literally. I'm too old to worry about it. I'm too damned fractious to pay attention to it. I say flatly that in my opinion that beautiful young man in Galilee 2,000 years ago was involved in this program. Everything about his life indicates to me that he was deeply, intimately involved in this program. He said as much while he was alive. He said, I'm not from here. This is not my kingdom. He said, in my father's house are many mansions out there. He says, I have other flocks. I have other sheep. He repeatedly made these things clear, but nobody grasped what he was talking about. He said to the people at the time, he said, you are as gods. What I do, you can do, and even more. He was trying desperately to get us to grasp and understand who and what we were. We were no great cosmic accident. We were no coincidence. It was important. There was a reason we were here. And he tried to explain to us. It's in the Quran. It's in the Bhagavad Gita. It's in the writings of Buddha. Every great religious teacher from the beginnings of our history has said essentially the same thing. But this is sensitive material. I, I made a comment at a conference one time in Dallas, Texas, which as many of you probably know is what we call in our Bible Belt. <clears throat> and after I had finished, I saw this little heavy set dude coming at me. He had a Bible tucked under his arm. And I thought, oh boy, I'm in for it. I had visions of us rolling on the floor here, he and I. Because Dallas is a, kind of a fundamentalist south there. Thank God I didn't get attacked. He grasped me, hugged me, kissed me with tears in his eyes and said, son, that's the best explanation of what I've been studying and living with all my life that I have ever heard. God bless you. Give me a kiss and disappeared. I say this to you because I'm convinced that almost everybody out there, including any type of Christian you could find, any kind of Muslim you might find, any Buddhist or Hindu you might find, if they are presented this information in the proper way, will accept it and understand it in the proper way. Now what am I getting out of here? What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that I believe the time is coming very, very soon that every major religion on this planet will probably collapse in ruins. I tell you that honestly because I see it happening. I see it beginning to occur. They're falling apart. The reason they are is they're not giving you the spiritual truths you need. I say also that when that time comes, I will be happy to see it happen. I will be pleased every major religion in ruins, literally around our knees. Because at that moment and at that time only, we, the people on this planet, will be able to build something new and we'll build something better and we'll go on from there. And we'll devote our future to true, pure spirit rather than religion. 
We have, over the years, butchered each other and shed blood in matters of religion much more than we have politics. I would like to see religion sort of fade away, become history. I'd like to see us all begin to grasp who and what we are, understand that there is a basic spirit within us, there is a spark, a divinity within us, that we are all the same. It doesn't matter what color we are or what church we go to, what language we speak, what political party we belong to, none of that matters. What matters is we are human beings, we are children of God, we are immortal beings, we are infinite beings, and we're all the same. We are brothers and we are sisters, and we're going to have to reach that conclusion and come to that conclusion very, very quickly, or we're not going to be able to go out there and take our place in that infinite universe of intelligence unless we do begin to grasp that we are one people from one tiny planet with one future and we're going to have to go out into space and take our destiny out there and take our rightful place out there as one people they're not going to allow us to come out there with our hatreds and our savagery and our bitterness and our bestiality the stuff that's going on in Bosnia must stop. The stuff that happened in Rwanda must never happen again. We've got to grasp that we are one species, one race, from one little tiny planet with one future. And we have to go out there together or we may not go out there at all. Now this is what I have concluded. These are some of the things I have reached after 30 years of research. I share them with you honestly and bluntly, and I tell you, don't believe me necessarily, but that's what I've concluded after 30 years. I understand, I see, I feel, I perceive that there is a door being opened for us. The UFO is a part of it. The crop circles are a part of it. The appearance of this beautiful lady who keeps showing up from time to time here, there, and everywhere. The Christians call her Mary, the mother of God, the mother of Christ. This beautiful lady has been in our midst and been involved with us since the beginning of our history. She's been appearing here, there, and everywhere. That is the same part of the same overall event. The crop circles, the UFOs, the appearance of the beautiful lady, the abductions, the fact that we are growing spiritually, we're beginning to pay more attention. It's all a part of this much larger whole. It tells me that a door is being opened for us out there to come out and take our place and see our destiny out there with the rest of them into this infinite universe filled with intelligent life. But we're going to have to do it as one people at one, one time together or we're not going to make it at all. Now, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Graham? Slide, Bob. I've got, I've got a little time yet. All right, but let's go back to the next slide, please. Oh, I have them here. I can do it. Thank you. Now, during my years of research and study, as I said, I studied the history. I wanted a, a broader perspective of what was happening. And I began to study art, history, literature. And I began to uncover some fascinating things that I never knew before. What you see in front of you is a religious painting that's roughly 400 years old, and it's about the life of this young man from Galilee, by the way, this carpenter, this young Jewish rabbi. But I show you this painting for a particular reason. I want you to look in the background and look at some of these interesting clouds back here, particularly that one and this one. And I thought to myself, those are fascinating. A meteorologist friend of mine says, those are those are lenticular clouds, damn it, don't you know those are lenticular clouds? They're very commonplace, you see them all the time. And I says, well, that very well may be. Here's another painting with lenticular clouds in the background involving the life of the young man from Galilee. Looks like a disc with a dome on top. Now, that could be my imagination at work. But I'm teasing you, there's more. This is a lenticular cloud photographed in the Soviet Union a few years ago. 
It was observed by a considerable number of people, and then it was observed to fly away at a high rate of speed. <clears throat> I wasn't aware lenticular clouds could do that. Here's another one. This hovered all by itself, no other clouds, hovered for at least an hour. A number of people stopped and looked at it because of its unusual shape. That lenticular cloud also was observed to fly away at a high rate of speed. Another picture of a lenticular cloud. Same thing, same story. Well, there's a purpose in my madness here. What am I getting toward here? Well, I'll show you. A series of photographs taken at Fort Belvoir, Virginia in the late 50s, a large U.S. military installation. A, young, a bunch of young soldiers were out training one afternoon. One of them had a camera, and they're sitting, taking a break, and they look up in the sky, and they see this. And they said, holy conniption, what's that? And they continued to watch, and they continued to take pictures, and this strange circular object in the sky proceeded to change right in front of their eyes. You can still see the rim, but they continued to snap pictures and they continued to look and their mouths were hanging open by this time. And this thing continued to turn itself into a cloud. And after it had done so, it flew away at a high rate of speed. The point I make is simple. The next time you're cloud watching, and you see lenticular clouds, you may be indeed looking at a lenticular cloud. But then again, you may not be looking at a lenticular cloud. Look carefully, pay attention. This is a lenticular cloud photographed in Denmark 10 years later, several thousand miles away from Fort Belvoir. An identical object, you can see the rim inside there. This was observed by a, a larger, large number of people this particular cloud had a kind of a jellyfish extension down here, but then they watched a while and after a time, it too flew away at a rather rapid pace. Another lenticular cloud, interestingly enough, moving smartly from right to left. You can even see the rim here. Now, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, there is a hard piece of hardware inside of that with intelligent beings inside of that. They're very clever, they're very intelligent, they're very highly technologically advanced, and they will sometimes mask themselves as clouds, not to upset the, uh, the common folk. But this one's moving rather smartly from right to left. It's even leaving a bit of a trail here behind it. Here's another famous one, photographed in New Mexico, near Holloman Air Force Base. This object is moving at a rather high speed from left to right. You can also see that it, too, seems to have something in the way of a trail of some kind behind it. The point I'm making is the next time you're cloud watching, well, look carefully. Uh, they may be, they may not be. It's fun. Now, I also told you that in my historical perspective, I began to collect information, photographs. I found that there are tons of artifacts all over the planet that are listed by a lot of researchers as uparts, out of place artifacts, objects that should not be. Little clay figurines, if you look at carefully and you say, my goodness, isn't that interesting? What do you suppose the fellow who made that was trying to communicate here. A faceplate, a helmet, uh, well, that's only one tiny example. There are others. This guy looks like he's carrying a parachute, for God's sake. I carried one very much like that a few years ago. The point I'm making is that uh, these little out-of-place artifacts are intriguing, and I believe they are valid bits and pieces of evidence that we need to pay attention to. This is a painting found in the Tassili Plateau in, Sa in the Sahara that's estimated to be thousands of years old. This is a piece of ceramic from Mexico.
created by an Aztec Indian, and I want you to look at this object. Looks to me like some chap peering out of a, of a space suit, probably, with a breathing apparatus here in front of his mouth. Now, it could be my vivid imagination. Maybe I'm reading too much into this. But I began to collect these bits and pieces, these uparts. This is the famous Palenque stone from Palenque in Yucatan. Engineers at NASA have looked at that and said, in the name of heaven, that guy is riding a ramjet. Engineers at NASA have studied this object. Here is Lord Shield Pakal leaning forward with his eyes according to an eyepiece, his hands on controls, his feet on control pedals here. He's sitting in the cockpit of what appears to be a ramjet. And the engineers at NASA says, my God, it's as clear as it can be even have the flames coming out in the back here. This is uh, in the Yucatan, Palenque, estimated to be about 800 years old. Inside, under this sarcophagus lid, was a six foot four bones. Lord Shield Pakal, one of the great priest kings of the Mayans. The Mayans are generally about five foot two, five foot four. Everybody's been intrigued by this. And archaeologists don't even want to talk about it because they can't explain it. I continued to collect bits and pieces. Now, these little characters are from Ecuador in South America. The archaeological team who found them said that they're at least a 1,000 years old. They're baked ceramic. They're baked clay. And I throw this out to you as a piece of evidence that the Indian who shaped and fashioned this a thousand years ago was trying to describe exactly what he saw. And in my view, this is a little dude in a spacesuit. It's very clear to me, at least, because the Russian spacesuits, the early ones, had legs very much like that, flexible. Here's control panels. Here's the faceplate. Probably this is an oxygen tank of some kind on his back. He's wearing gloves. And there's more. There's another one. Look at this little dude. Now what in the world was the Indian who made this trying to communicate? He saw something. He didn't quite understand what he saw. But this is what he did. Now this was a thousand years ago. Just consider it. This little drawing is an object Thank you for focusing that. This little drawing is an object that happens to reside in the museum, the archaeological museum in Istanbul in Turkey. I owe this to Zechariah Sitchin, who found this and put it in his latest book. The museum staff at Istanbul does not like to ex explain or display this thing because they don't know how to explain or display it. But if you look carefully, you'll see what I say to be a little guy in a spacesuit. Here's his boot. Here's his helmet. Here's the eyepiece. He's got his arms on some kind of controls of some kind. And so help me God, there are three thruster booster rockets on the back, very much like what you find on the U.S. Uh, space program in the, uh, the shuttle. Sharp point here. Can you guys focus that just a wee bit? Now this is what we call an upart. This is an out of place artifact. This is something that shouldn't exist. This was estimated to be roughly 4,000 years old. They've estimated its age at 2000 BC. Now what in the world was going on 2000 years before Christ where little dudes are flying around apparently in something like this with thruster rockets on the back? This is a painting that hangs in a university library right here in England. This painting is on the wall at uh, Cambridge, in the library at Cambridge. It's a Flemish painting that was painted in 1710, and it's a religious scene. It represents the baptism of the young man from Galilee. But I want you to look up here. Now, this is an artist in 1710, and what has he drawn here? What is this circular object with this light in the middle? What are these beams coming down from it? And what did he know in 1710? 
that we are just now beginning to pay attention to. So I found a photograph taken just a few years ago of a piece of solid metal that's flying in the sky. This is a legitimate photograph of a UFO and I want you to look at the light here, whatever that may be. Play with it, look at it, wonder what in the world is that kind of a shaped object doing over a scene about the life of the carpenter from Galilee, beaming rays of light down. And here's an actual photograph of one of those things. This is a famous Lollodoff plate. It's another upart, it's another inexplicable artifact. It was found in Nepal by a Russian archaeologist right after World War I. It now resides in the Berlin Museum and they don't know what it's made out of. It's a combination of metal or ceramic. You tap it and it rings like a bell, but the museum will not let anybody cut into it or drill into it. It's estimated to be several thousands of years old, and I throw it out to you as a challenge, as a temptation, as a tantalizing piece of history. Particularly, I point out to you that on this Lollodoff plate here are a number of scenes that I find particularly intriguing. Thank you, guys. Look at this. Now, that could be simply a streamlined shape, but look down here. Those of you who studied UFOs and the entire phenomenon, this is a little gray, if I have ever seen a little gray. He is exactly what we see when we see little grays. And this is a little male. If you ladies will forgive me, it's very clear here that he has an appendage there, which clearly identifies him as a male. But this is on a an out-of-place artifact. They don't even know what it's made out of, and even beyond that, this Berlin Museum artifact has a tendency to change its weight. They put it on a set of scales to weigh it. They forgot and left it for a time, and they came back later, and it had shifted its weight. It gets heavier and it gets lighter, and no one knows how in the world that happens. This is the famous Lollodoff plate, an upart, an out-of-place artifact. But I share it with you because I'm particularly interested in this symbol right here. Interestingly enough, that symbol appeared on one of the I-beam girders from a crashed UFO from New Mexico, who interestingly enough appeared on one of Ray Santilli's films not too long ago about the recovered artifacts, the recovered wreckage from a crashed UFO in New Mexico. Now, I don't know what that means, but that symbol, that particular symbol is identical to one on the I-beam girder from the crashed UFO from New Mexico. People have told me that these other symbols appear to be very similar to astrological signs that this Lollodoff thing is several thousands of years old. They don't know what it's made out of, and they can't for the life of themselves explain why it shifts itself in weight. Another upart, another little piece of evidence I believe it's important to look at. Now here's a medieval tapestry, and my photograph is not that good, and I ask you to bear with me, but this thing's roughly eight or 900 years old. It depicts a scene from the life of the carpenter from Galilee. And I want you to look up here in the sky above the city. There's a disc with a dome on top. What in the world is that doing in a medieval tapestry? This is a medieval fresco from Yugoslavia, another scene from the life of the young man from Galilee. But what is this in the sky flying over the scene of the life of the carpenter. There's a guy sitting in this thing with his hands on controls, and this, this dude is scooting across the sky. <clears throat> what do you suppose we could make of that? What is the artist trying to communicate to us from eight or 900 years ago? This is a medieval fresco. This is older than Renaissance. But it gets better. This is one of my favorites. <clears throat> this painting hangs on the wall of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. 
It's Renaissance, over 400 years old. I'd like to share it with you because it was painted by one of the great Renaissance masters, a friar by the name of Filippo Lippi. He's considered to be one of the great masters. This scene he's painted here is a scene with the Madonna and the baby Jesus and his cousin, uh, Saint uh, John. No. Who was the one? John the Baptist. Yes, John the Baptist. So this is John and Jesus. Here's the mother. But what in the world is this over her shoulder? And what is it doing in a Renaissance painting that's over 400 years old? Now here's an enlargement here. And here's this strange object. And here's a guy on the ground looking up at it, shielding his eyes from the sun. And there's a dog down there barking. And I began to look at that and I thought, it's getting curiouser and curiouser, as Alice in Wonderland said. This is a blow-up of it. Here's the guy shielding his eyes, looking up. The dog is barking. The reason I share this with you is that object in this 450-year-old painting is identical to an object that was watched by roughly 40 people at a place called Bonai, New Guinea, a few years ago, a mission school run by an Anglican minister named the Reverend Gill. Now, the Reverend Gill and all of his students went out from the mission school and watched an object that they described almost identical to this hovering over the beach. This thing sat there silently hovering over the beach for about an hour. The kids got excited and they jumped around and waved. They saw people coming out and walking around a deck up here. Human beings walking around a circular deck. So the kids got very excited and they were waving and yelling and jumping up and down and after a few minutes the Reverend Gill and his students noticed that one of the human beings up on top looked over and waved back. The thing went about its business. It looked like they were working up there on something. This thing is hovering silently over the beach at Bonai. This report is one of the classics in UFO files. I don't know whether you can believe an Anglican minister and 40 kids, but I generally tend to think that there's something to that report particularly since it is identical to an object that appears in a Renaissance painting hanging on the walls of a museum in Italy. Another what I call upart, an interesting little bit of data that I think needs to be examined. Here's another one. This painting is 200 years old. It appears to represent God giving the tablets to Moses, the Ten Commandments. But what do you see in the sky here? If you look at these closely with a magnifying glass, they're circular disc-shaped objects with domes on top. Now in the Dead Sea Scrolls, these objects are known and described as chariots of glory. Little piece of information there for you to play with. Chariots of glory. Am I being too blunt on my approach here? Am I, are you with me? Thank you. Now, let's go back a few years. These are cave paintings from the, the Pyrenees between France and Spain. These paintings were discovered a number of years ago. They've been dated at least 20,000 years and in some cases closer to 40,000 years. Now these are either early Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal. Now these artists were very good. I want you to look at some of these figures here. The horse, the boar, the mammoth, Another horse, I think, uh, an elk, a bull. Look at this, a buffalo of some kind, a bison. These artists, 20,000 years ago, were good artists. Some of the most beautiful paintings we've ever seen have been found in those caves in the south of France and northern Spain. But I show you this because I want you to take a look at a couple of other things. Look at this and these, and this, and these, and up here. Now, a number of French researchers became intrigued by these and began to do some research on their own, and they catalog cataloged much of these paintings. French are very good at this sort of thing. So they cataloged these things, and these, these little diagrams and drawings are from the caves. But look here. 
and here. And what do you suppose these dotted lines mean? I think that the point's well made. Here's some more. Look down here. Let's move along. These appear on the walls of caves that were painted roughly 20 to 40,000 years ago. Look at this one again. That object is exactly what I showed you at the beginning of the slideshow flying over Central Europe. Exactly the same shape. Look at this. What do those dotted lines mean? Well, to me, it means that the artist was conveying that this object is moving. These guys were not stupid. Our ancestors were not dumb. Now, this is something I found out of an art book myself. It, I've always been intrigued by ancient Egypt. This is a wood panel off the our sarcophagus from Abydos that was dated about the first or second dynasty. That means it goes back a hell of a long time, roughly 2800 BC. The hieroglyphics on this sarcophagus describe this object as the chest of Osiris. Now, I remembered from my ancient Egyptian history that Osiris was one of the great creator gods of the Egyptians, apparently an alien, apparently an extraterrestrial, the chest of Osiris. And I thought, well, that's intriguing, but then I turned it upside down, and I looked at it again, and I said, my God, this looks like one of his runabouts. Here's a jet or rockets coming out of the back. Here's the cabin he's sitting in. Here is the intake up at the front of this thing. That's how Osiris all got around over Egypt three, 4,000 years ago. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into this. I'm an old man. I begin to tend to lose it after a time. But I tease you with these things, and I tell you that they all add up to a body of evidence that you cannot deny. Now, there's a series of photographs taken in Puerto Rico. Experts have gone out of their way to discredit these photographs. These are the famous Amaury Rivera pictures. I want you to look at this object here. The only problem the experts who are trying to debunk and explain this away is that there were a couple of hundred people on the ground watching this whole event as it was taking place while Rivera was taking pictures. What you see here, and this has been published in Quest International UFO book, is a U.S. Navy F-14 Tomcat. And look at this object, and look at that light in the middle, almost identical to the one I showed you before, almost identical to the one that appeared in the 1710 Flemish painting. <clears throat> look here. This Tomcat's quite Im impressed with this object, flies all around it, made several passes, it was the sound of the jet that attracted the people's attention. Because he'd come in and make a pass, and then he'd throw in his afterburners, and people stood and said, what in the hell is that? There were roughly 200 people watching this series of events. The uh, skeptics don't know how to explain away the 200 people. But here you have this Tomcat again, an F-14, flying off of a U.S. aircraft carrier. And here you have a disc with a dome on top and a dome on the bottom. I find it interesting. It's simply another case that I think needs to be looked at. This is a famous photograph photographed in New Jersey, USA, a number of years ago. This object hovered over a reservoir, a water reservoir, for a couple of hours, caused enough excitement that roughly 300 people stopped their cars. They were, it was late in the afternoon, evening, middle of winter. The reservoir was frozen solid. This object is hovering over the frozen reservoir. People stop their cars, and there's a traffic jam. There's a real jam, real congestion. People stop, get out. The roads are crammed with people. The pe police showed up, and the police watched the series of events. The object hovered there for roughly an hour and beamed a light beam down on the frozen reservoir. And when the object departed, everyone noticed that there was a perfectly circle Fro uh, it melted in the frozen ice from this beam of light. This object then flew away. Roughly 300 people never got onto the front pages of the New York Times, never got onto the front pages or got into the evening news. Typical U.S., the media ignores this kind of thing. I think they do it here as well. This is a famous Concord picture. We're getting close to the end of this thing. 
British scientists, uh, French scientists, some Germans, I think some US guys, a number of years ago during an eclipse of the sun, hired a Concorde and flew from the United States to Europe or to the north coast of Africa following the eclipse so they could photograph it. The Concorde is clipping along, what, about 1,800 miles an hour? They're up around 45,000 feet. But someone in the Concorde who were taking pictures of the eclipse noticed something that had been following them all the way across the Atlantic. Now here you can see the envelope of atmosphere around the planet. Africa is down here somewhere. A couple of the scientists says, what in the hell is that? They took a few more pictures. This one's right on the edge, doesn't show very well. But they're way up, and this thing is following them across the Atlantic. This is a blow-up of what they were looking at. Now, in my opinion, this simply is a, a spacecraft, an alien craft, a very highly developed technical craft. And there are guys inside of here that were probably taking pictures of the scientists in the Concorde who were taking pictures of these guys inside of here. And this sort of thing has gone on for years. Another interesting little anomaly, a photograph from World War II of something found by the Russian army in the middle of winter, half buried in the ground. These are Russian soldiers back here, an armored personnel carrier, but what do you suppose this strange shaped thing is? Doesn't look like a Messerschmitt to me. Another fascinating little anomaly, an object that was being pulled out of the Norwegian Sea by a Norwegian fishing trawler a few years ago. One of the crewmen took the picture and the picture survived long enough to get published in a newspaper in Europe. What in the world is that that they're pulling up out of the Norwegian Sea? What a strangely shaped fish that is. This is another famous photograph taken a few years ago in New Zealand. A doctor and his family were on a picnic, and they'd spent the day and had a delightful time, and they were getting ready to pack up and go home, when an enormous, circular, lighted object flew above them. The doctor says this thing was gigantic, and it was slowly spinning. And it was covered with lights, and the doctor says, so help me, when I looked up, I could have sworn I saw faces peering down at me. And I said, to myself, this is probably the zoo tour. I have this vision of somewhere at some place, sometime. They sell tickets, popcorn, soda pop, Cracker Jack. They go aboard and say, let's go down and look at the earthlings and see what they're doing tonight. So they come down and they slowly come across and the doctor says this thing was spinning slowly like a carousel, completely silent and it was gigantic, and he said, so help me, I saw faces looking at me. This is what I call a zoo tour. We've had other examples of this. Another photograph from France. These are not legs, these are light beams. A glowing object. These are famous photographs from Belgium. I got these from a young man named Patrick Ferrens, who was a head of the Belgian UFO research group called SOBEPS. This is one of those gigantic triangles that hovered over Belgium a few years ago. The same kind of thing that hovered over the Hudson Valley in the United States a few years before that. And it's the same kind of object that's appearing regularly in your skies here in the United Kingdom. Mostly at night, but I'm telling you, pay attention, you're going to be seeing some of them during the daylight. These things are gigantic. They're roughly sometimes three to four hundred feet across. When they've been seen on edge, they look like they're 60 to 70 feet thick. Massive, gigantic objects, totally silent, that can hover motionlessly above a police car and drive the officers wild. This is a photograph taken by a cop in Belgium. You can't really see very much here. You have to look carefully. You can see a bit of the edge. But Patrick took this thing and put it in a computer, and there's what you see. This is the shape of this thing. This is a gigantic triangular object, roughly 400 feet across. These are corner lights. Now, this light in the middle was noted to depart 
come off, fly around, go back, and reattach itself. Now, who is behind this? What's really happening here? The next series of pictures are ta were taken by the federal police in Mexico just a few short years ago. They thought they had a major drug operation going on. They'd seen all these lights in the sky at night, and it was their job, of course, to track down the druggies. And the federales devoted a lot of time and energy, and they gave cameras out to their officers, and they went out at night and started taking pictures. When the officers brought the photos back to the office, the commandante had a fit. He practically had a fit. He says, what in the hell have you guys been doing? What the hell is this? You've been out drinking tequila or something. And they say, no, Commandante. These are what we saw in the sky at night. Now, these are real. The federal police took these pictures. Many witnesses observed these things flying in the skies at night. Should they have appeared on the front pages of your newspaper, of the US? Did any of us in the United States see these on the evening news? No. I wonder why. Look at that. I can tell you this is not a drug operation. If the drug runners have got this kind of hardware, we're in big trouble. <laughs> Look at this one. To me, that's absolutely beautiful. Very similar to one that was photographed over Gulf Breeze, Florida, not too many years ago. Look at that. Now what's going on? This is a daylight picture. This is not by night. This is another object shaped a little different with a dome. Lights around the edge and a dome down here. These things are in the skies over Mexico all the time. Now, let's move along quickly. These photographs, I have to apologize to you, are not that clear. These are NASA photographs taken by Apollo astronauts on or near the moon a number of years ago of things they saw. This is the object. This is a bit of a blow up here. Here's the object again, blow up. Every one of our NASA Apollo astronauts, every one of them, who made that trip to the moon and back, saw these objects. A circular disk with a dome on top. The guys were so excited about it, many of them wanted to talk about it. But NASA flat told them, if you talk about it, you're going to jail. This is this object. If you, at the photograph, you can see there's a little bit of a trail behind it. They were photographing the moon's surface, and this thing flew in front of them. I resent these pictures because I had to go to a Japanese researcher to get copies of these. These were taken by my astronauts, taken with cameras bought and paid for by the American taxpayer, with film bought and paid for by the American taxpayer. The whole damned Apollo program was paid for by the American taxpayer, and the American public have not seen these. Where did I find them? In Japan. Figure that out. This is one of the better ones. Look at this beautiful thing. This is a large, self-luminous object with windows. I think this was Apollo 12. Look at that. That should have been on the front page of every damn newspaper in the world. But they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't dare do it because they would have then to try to explain to you what it was. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a little photograph, what I believe to be an authentic, legitimate, real picture of one of the little gray dudes. This was taken in Mexico. He apparently was alive and well. And you study the photograph, you can see a little bit about his clothing, the wrinkle of his neck, the little jumper he's got on. There are lines in his face. You know, of course, that there are roughly four different groups of little grays. There are the little tiny dudes with the round heads. Then there are several other different types. And then there is one group that is roughly six feet tall that are almost human. Some of the little guys do not appear to be a species or members of a race. When they've been found in these crashed disks and the medical examiners have checked them out, they've concluded that they are biological androids. They're clones. They have no reproductive capability. They have no 
alimentary tract, they have no rectum, they have nothing that indicates that they are reproducible, reproducible or that they can even eat. They have no teeth, they have little membranes in their mouth. British medical examiners who examined and autopsied a number, autopsied a number of them from a crash disc near Timmensdorfer, Germany in 1964 conducted the autopsies and said, my God, every one of them were exactly the same. It's like they were cut from a pattern. No reproductive capability, no alimentary tract. Every one was absolutely identical. Now that doesn't mean that all of the grays are laboratory products, but some of them are. And they just make them. This is another picture from Mexico, which I found particularly sad because this is in a photograph of a crash and a little survivor of a crash in the United States a number of years ago. And this little baby only lived about a month. You look at it carefully and you look at it closely and these little fingers are wrapped around the thumb of the nurse here. And when I look at this and I look at those little eyes, I, it, it's haunting to me. I can never forget them. This little, little creature didn't make it very long. She was a female, and she was inside one of these crashed discs. They tried to keep her alive, but they weren't successful. Now, I'm closing with a couple of pictures like Tony shows earlier, and I'm doing this on purpose. To me, these are some of the most beautiful photographs I have ever seen. They're shots of our galaxy. They're shots of our universe. They're pictures of this incredible universe that we are a part of. I li like to look at them because they're absolutely sheer beauty. I want you to look at this. The latest estimates from NASA is that there are roughly 400 billion stars in our galaxy. Roughly. This is a big guess. There are roughly 400 billion galaxies in the known universe. Think about that. And look at those pictures. They take my breath away sometime because this is a part of our community of life. This is a picture of a galaxy very much like the one we live in. Our galaxy is shaped very much like this. And if we were way out in space looking back at our own galaxy, the planet Earth and our little sun would be out here in the suburbs on the edge. I show these to you because I think if they de give you what they give me, it's give a sense of perspective and it's almost, it's almost a sacred feeling that I have about life and the universe. Over the years, and this is probably the most beautiful photograph of all, and this is the last one in my slideshow, and I show it to you because I want you to look at that beautiful living creature. Over the years I have concluded that life, consciousness, intelligence fills the universe. You are immortal beings, you are living systems, you are living on a living system. We are part of a solar system which is part of a galaxy which is part of an infinite universe literally teeming with intelligent life and it's conscious and it's aware and there's a purpose and there is a reason for every bit of it. There is a purpose and there is a reason for you. In my opinion, you're not an accident. You're not a great coincidence. You're not a great galactic mistake. You are a purposeful, immortal being and there's a reason you're here and you're on your way to something greater than any of us can ever begin to imagine. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about pure spirit. Now I leave this up and in closing I must say something to you. We're in for some difficult times. They've already begun and they're going to get worse. In the next few short years you're going to have worldwide geological cataclysms of one kind or another. They've already started. You're going to have worldwide famine. You're going to have worldwide wars, disasters, plagues. 
Everything in the book of Revelation that you've ever read as you were a Christian going to school, everything you've ever read in the Bhagavad Gita, if you're a Hindu, it's all the same. We're all in for some exciting times. And I say that as an understatement. We're in for some difficult times. But I want to leave you with something as I close. Something that means a lot to me, and I hope it means something to you. It's important that we not give in to fear. <clears throat> in the years ahead, as things become difficult, and I mean really difficult, and the shock of some of these re realizations, you're going to see governments collapse, you're going to see churches collapse, you're going to see a worldwide economic collapse. Remember this, if you remember nothing else. Count Leo Tolstoy, <clears throat> a great writer, a great philosopher, a great poet that I've always admired. Tolstoy repeatedly said, there is something in the human spirit that will survive and that will prevail. There is a light that will not go out no matter how dark the world becomes. And in the spirit of that light, I want to say to you, God bless you, thank you, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, time has always been against us uh, today, but um, I'm going to ask Bob in closing, for the last 10 minutes, he did bring across some footage. And this footage is something that you've got to see, and I promise you, 10 minutes. Um, he'd like to just basically go over, uh, with a verbal commentary, just what it is exactly that you're going to be seeing right now. When we were at Solihull, we didn't have the colour. I'm pleased to say we've rectified that problem. So, gentlemen at the back, if you would kindly... Put on this footage, we'll hopefully enjoy it. And Bob, if you do a commentary. Listen to this excited photographer here. This was in Germany. Ufo, Ufo. He's running across the field trying to stay up with this thing. Any of you have ever seen one of these, you can understand his excitement. If it had been someone my age, we'd have had a heart attack by this point. Now this is a, the same scene slowed down. There does appear to be something in the way of a diffuse energy expression down here underneath this thing. A different kind of color. Sometimes it's not visible to the eye, but the cameras will pick it up. I can imagine there are guys sitting inside of that thing saying, I wonder what they think of this. What do they make of this? <clears throat> this sequence has a number of excellent uh, clips. Sadly enough, it's not professionally tied together. There's no auditor auditory following here. There's no... Uh, there's a gap and then there's another picture and another picture. We have Germany here, then there are some pictures of New York, then there are some pictures in Mexico. But these pictures have been examined and this is real. This was a pretty good sized object. This was 35 or 40 feet at least. 
maybe more. And you'll see a moment that we're going to have a split screen here. You're going to have pictures from Mexico compared with pictures from Germany. There you go. This is Germany. This is Mexico. And ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, this is not swamp gas. Bless his heart, old Alan Hynek never was able to live that down. Is this Carlos? This is his. Young man outside of Guadalajara by the name of Carlos Diaz. These pictures have never been shown in the United States, either on the evening papers or the evening television news. It's like our officials, our authorities in the United States and in Britain would wish this thing would go away. Well, it won't, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and I ask you to stay tuned because you're going to see some things in the next few months, in the next couple of years. They're going to shake you up completely. I also wanted at this point <clears throat> to thank the young man who introduced himself to me earlier this evening, the young serviceman from Menwith Hill, the uh, National Security Agency facility just a few miles from here young man came up and introduced himself and I want to say thank you for coming. Hopefully, maybe we had time for a beer. I... The object is not jumping, the cameraman is. The object is moving, but it's not jumping. <clears throat> These are all fairly recent, within the last six months, roughly. Now this is a picture taken in New York not too long ago. There's a party on board a ship. The U.S., they do this from time to time. They go aboard ship, they go, go up and down the river, they have dinner, they dance, there's a band playing. They take pictures of the city of New York, the World Trade Center here. Sometimes they get something they didn't expect. the World Trade Center. Keep your eye up here. wonder what that was. I have this uncanny sense that we're taking pictures of them and they're taking pictures of us. I would like to see some of their pictures of us. I'll bet those are buttes.
That appears to be a pretty good sized object. Is that it? That's not the best stuff, but that's about all we have time for, I suspect. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, good people. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, because we've, we've run over, um, I know that Bob and Tony and Stanton will take some of your questions, but these have to be out in the foyer. They're going to be there for a little while now, so no official question time as such. We'll be back here on Saturday evening, April the 27th, here in Leeds.